In the 1950s, a weapon was invented that has become more powerful than America's deadliest weapons of mass destruction. It is the weapon of mass deception, and it is right in our own living rooms. The hypnotizing world of picture television brings us the news of the world through two central news agencies called Reuters and the Associated Press. The Rothschilds bought Reuters in the 1800s, which later bought the Associated Press and made the Rothschild family owners of the world's largest central news services. To the present day, the world depends on these Rothschild-owned central news services as their main source of news and information. In his book called Who Owns the TV Networks, author Eustace Mullins claims that the major TV networks, radio stations, newspapers, and publishing empires are controlled by the Rothschild, Rockefeller, and J.P. Morgan money cartels through their corporate conglomerates. The Bankster-owned media conglomerates include weapons manufacturers General Electric and Westinghouse, which profit from promoting wars. Control over the internet, publishing, recording, and top cable companies can be traced back to the same big five media empires, General Electric, Time Warner, Viacom, Disney, and News Corp. These media monopolies are owned directly or indirectly by the Rothschild, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, and Oppenheimer Brotherhood. Yes, there are now more stations and more media voices, but they're all coming from the same ventriloquist. Every TV show needs corporate sponsors, and corporate sponsors sponsor pro-business, pro-government programming, and journalists who support the agenda of the big five media owners. While two-thirds of the world goes hungry, these banksters offer gazillion-dollar sponsorships to sports athletes to play with their balls. Why? because they keep the masses distracted from the important issues. The media and banking monopolists now have the power to make or break political leaders around the globe. Why haven't the networks made a TV movie of the week about how the Bush family made their family fortune? The movie could be called The Awful Truth, starring George W.'s great-grandfather Samuel P. Bush, whose Buckeye Steel Castings Company supplies parts for Edward Harriman's railroads who in turn provides rail shipments for John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil, who in turn gets monopoly financing from the Rothschilds. The movie could be made into a TV series starring Samuel's son, Prescott Bush, as the managing director of a Nazi steel manufacturing plant in Poland called Silesian Consolidated Steel. In episode one, Prescott Bush forwards American financing to his German partner, Fritz Tyson through the Union Banking Corporation in New York. Fritz Tyson arranges a contract with Nazi Germany's IG Farben Company for free Jewish slave labor in Bush's steel manufacturing plant at the Auschwitz concentration camp. Episode 2 shows Skull and Bonesman Prescott Bush and Avril Harriman getting caught under Trading with the Enemy Act as the U.S. government moves in and seizes all of their shares in Union Banking Corporation. In Episode 3, Prescott's son, the first George Bush, is director of the CIA. George puts drug king Manuel Noriega on the CIA payroll allowing thousands of tons of cocaine to hit the streets of America via the Panama Canal. In episode four, George's son, the second George Bush, becomes partners with Osama bin Laden's older brother, Salem bin Laden, in a Texas oil company called Arbusto Energy. Episode five introduces George W. shady younger brother, Neil Bush, ripping off the elderly in the Silverado savings and loan scandal that cost U.S. taxpayers $1.3 billion. In episode six, the Florida election is fixed by George W.'s older brother, Jeb Bush, who puts brother George into the top job at the White House, which brings us back to Auschwitz and the concluding episode with George W. Bush visiting the slave labor camp where his grandfather helped build the Bush family fortune on free Jewish slave labor. Sides are a sobering reminder that of the power of evil.
the need for people to resist evil. Ladies and gentlemen, as a follow-up to the TV series, an award show could celebrate the 20-year friendship of the Bush and Bin Laden families and their shared investment in the Carlyle Group. The Carlyle Group is one of America's largest weapons contractors. For the Bush and Bin Laden families, war means profits, big profits. Although the media creates the illusion of freedom of the press, the dominant opinion and messages always serve the banksters' agenda. The chilling reality is that up to 15% of the tax money deducted from your paycheck each month buys the bombs and pays the salaries of troops to commit these atrocities. Rivers of blood from innocent families and their children is on everybody's hands. The plan for world domination by the banksters cannot be accomplished without your cooperation. That plan was formulated in 1773 at Mayor Rothschild's goldsmith shop by 13 influential German-Jewish families. Among them were Rothschild, Oppenheimer, Warburg, and Schiff. Their formula for global control is the 3M formula, money control, media control, and military control. Two, one, mark, and visual have it. Like changes to the rules that gave these families the media and money monopolies, new laws are being passed to transfer military control to them by privatizing the military. But if they're killing terrorists, who cares if they are government soldiers or corporate soldiers? A more important question to ask is, who exactly are the terrorists and where do terrorists get their training? The answer is right smack in America at Fort Benning, Georgia. Until January 2001, America's terrorist training school was called School of the Americas. But because of massive protests against its activities, the name was changed to WISC. Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation. Actress Susan Sarandon narrated a documentary film called School of the Assassins. The film exposes the school as a terrorist training camp whose graduates are well-known murderers, torturers, state terrorists, and dictators, including drug king Manuel Noriega. The role of terrorists in the bankster-owned media is to scare the living tax dollars out of citizens, and timing is everything. On the second anniversary of the 911 attack on the World Trade Center, George Bush asked for an $87 billion increase in military spending. At the same time, the media released a dramatic video showing Osama bin Laden alive and well and threatening to make the 911 attack seem like foreplay. How much do we really know about America's favorite villain? Multi-millionaire Osama bin Laden was the 17th of 52 children fathered by a wealthy construction baron named Mohammed bin Laden, who had close ties to the Saudi royal family and the Bush family. In 1979, the American CIA and Pakistan's ISI financed an anti-Soviet group in Afghanistan and provoked a profitable 10-year war with the Russians. When the Russians invaded Afghanistan, the CIA hired Osama bin Laden to recruit and train al-Qaeda fighters to fight the Russian army. Invasion. Anti-communist guerrillas in Afghanistan have been at the front line to fight against the spread of communism. But what was the fight really all about? Not carrots or potatoes. It was about poppies endless fields of opium poppies that provide over 70 percent of the world's heroin supply to heroin addicts worldwide. These are very uncomfortable issues for politicians. It was a dramatic story, but the media failed to tell us the less heroic side of Afghanistan's freedom fighters. America's new friends had become hooked on the economics of the poppy. During the war, many of the Mujahideen radically increased the production of opium, the raw ingredient of heroin. 
Opioid abuse in the United States is at epidemic levels. This is probably the worst drug situation in our country in decades, if not a century. With deaths more than quadrupling between 1999 and 2015. The international drug trade began in 1606 when Queen Elizabeth I built England's well by trafficking illegal opium from India to China. British East India Shipping Company and profited handsomely not just from drug trafficking but from trafficking African slaves with her slave trader John Hawkins. First knighted her slave trader with the noble title of Sir John Hawkins. By 1830, the British had distanced themselves from dope dealing by granting opium monopoly rights to the Jewish Sassoon family, who became known as the Rothschilds of the Far East. As an agent for the Crown, David Sassoon shared his dope profits with Queen Victoria. The British East India Company built a major factory to process the opium here at Ghazapur. It's still a lucrative owner for the Indian government, which sells opiates to the world's pharmaceutical industry. When the Chinese banned opium and destroyed 600 chest loads of the addictive drug, Sassoon and the British retaliated. It was a financial disaster for the British. With huge profits at stake, they retaliated with the Opium Wars of 1843 and 1858. The forces of the market were to defeat China's moral prohibition. Sassoon and the British forced drug addiction onto an entire nation, stole the island of Hong Kong, and made Hong Kong the capital of the British international drug trade. In 1872, Queen Victoria knighted David Sassoon's son, Albert Sassoon, who spread the illegal opium trade throughout China and Japan. In 1887, Sir Albert Sassoon married Aline Carolyn Rothschild and joined the pirated fortunes of the Sassoon drug cartel with the Rothschild money cartel. Today, it's business as usual for the descendants of the Sassoon and Rothschild families who socialize with Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Charles as elite members of Britain's inner power circle. Many have been granted royal titles, like Sir, Countess, Baron, and Marquis, but their many victims aren't fooled by the crowns, the titles, and the tuxedos. They have very different titles for them. Titles like liars, thieves, dope dealers, and mass murderers, on the other side of the Atlantic, a member of the same opium smuggling syndicate, Samuel Russell, founded Yale University's Skull and Bones Brotherhood with drug money. Exclusive members were financed into political power positions in the CIA, the U.S. Supreme Court, and the White House. When Skull and Bonesman George Bush Sr. became CIA director, in the 1980s, the CIA recruited Osama bin Laden to train Al-Qaeda and Mujahideen fighters in Afghanistan. The job of Osama's trainees was not just to fight the Russian communists, it was to run Afghanistan's multi-billion dollar opium trade. Heroin, manufactured from Afghan opium, supplied 250 to 300 billion dollars annually to Wall Street and the U.S. banks. Authors Alfred McCoy and Michael Levine tied the CIA to this unholy drug alliance and received national attention when the CIA tried to suppress their books. Michael Levine became a best-selling author when he wrote about his experience of this unholy alliance. After 30 years distinguished service with the DEA, he could write with some authority. You could look at what they did to me in, uh, as a, uh, an example in microcosm of Central Intelligence's actions and the State Department in uh, completely subverting the drug war. You know, the drug war was something that only existed in the minds of Americans, on the streets of America, for kids like my brother, for cops who died. There, there was no drug war. The biggest drug dealers in the world were given a license to sell drugs to Americans to support themselves. And this continued right down from Southeast Asia through the Mujahideen, through the Contras. 
But how was the heroin smuggled into the United States? One of America's most gruesome secrets is that during the Vietnam War, heroin was smuggled into the United States by hiding it inside the body bags of dead American soldiers. By the end of the 1960s, one-third of U.S. soldiers in Vietnam and close to one million United States citizens were hooked on heroin. Drugs like LSD, mescaline, marijuana, and hashish also swamped the streets and college campuses of America. Who or what turned America's youth onto these illegal drugs? Celebrity anti-war activists like Aldous Huxley, Timothy Leary, Allen Ginsberg, and Bertrand Russell sold America's youth on acid rock, tripping out, and one world government. Their financing came from the Warburg Banksters and IPS, Institute for Policy Studies. Over 100 million doses of LSD that hit the streets of America were purchased by Timothy Leary and Alan Dulles through S.G. Warburg's Sandoz AB Pharmaceutical Company in Switzerland. Free sample size packages of acid were handed out not only on college campuses, but at rock concerts, where musicians persuaded millions of fans to get high. Critics of the drug culture blame parents, teachers, law enforcement, and everybody except the people behind it all, namely the Rothschild Warburg Banksters and their Committee of 300. According to Dr. John Coleman, who wrote the story of the Committee of 300, the Beatles rock group were brought to America by the Tavistock Institute. Tavistock launched the drug culture revolution in America to popularize and normalize social drug use. Through their record companies and advertising monopolies, the banksters have packaged and financed their celebrity salesmen to anesthetize, addict, and enslave billions of people worldwide with dependencies on both prescription and non-prescription, legal and illegal drugs. Those drugs range from alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine to Prozac, crack cocaine, and heroin. Like the phony war on terrorism, the phony war on drugs is a cat and mouse game being fought with one hand and fed with the other. The peace symbol adopted by the drug flower children of the 60s was designed by Gerald Holtham, who was commissioned by One World Government salesman Bertrand Russell. The symbol was never designed as a symbol of peace, but as a symbol of death. It is actually a cross turned upside down with the arms broken and is used by Satanists and in Druid witchcraft. In Germany, the symbol is known as the death rune and is found on tombstones of Hitler's Nazi SS officers. CIA's team of ex-Nazis and skull and bonesmen financed and trained Osama bin Laden, who pushed the Russians out of Afghanistan by 1989. The CIA then trained and installed the ruthless Taliban regime to run the booming opium trade. After a decade, the long friendship between America and the Taliban suddenly turned ugly. At a meeting held on December 4, 1997 at Unical headquarters, American oil men made a proposal to the Taliban about building a pipeline through Afghanistan. Rothschild Shell Oil and Rockefeller's Exxon Oil had invested billions in the Kazakhstan oil and gas reserves just north of Afghanistan. Now they needed a pipeline to transport it to the Persian Gulf. The Taliban demanded a bigger cut and turned down the proposal. Suddenly, the banksters' American-controlled media were calling the Taliban monsters, evildoers, and cruel villains who beat up on women. On July 4, 1999, President Clinton froze the Taliban's U.S. assets and bank accounts and imposed trade sanctions on Afghanistan. By February 2001, the Taliban destroyed most of Afghanistan's opium crops. In May, Secretary of State Colin Powell announced a gift of 43 million U.S. taxpayers' dollars to the Taliban. He called it a reward to the Taliban for destroying the opium crops. But members of the new George W. Bush White House knew the Taliban would use the 43 million for more sinister purposes. Uh, 
not just not connecting the dots, but not getting the dots. Why was it that CIA was unable to collect information for years uh, inside Afghanistan when they had authority to kill bin Laden for over two and a half years? Why were they unable to kill him or his lieutenants? Why didn't they have a better capability to do something about it at the source? Could it be that the bankster supported U.S. administration is controlling both sides of the war on terror? George Bush Jr. attacked the poverty-stricken war-ravaged country of Afghanistan only four weeks after 9-1-1. The U.S. and British military dropped 12,000 bombs on thousands of buildings and homes, pounding them into dust and rubble and killing 8,000 Afghan people. 20,000 more people died from war-related cold, starvation, and disease. Nobody made a big-budget TV production out of the massacre with a God Bless Afghanistan movie score. The U.S.-British war on Afghanistan left behind millions of starving people and thousands of women who are still veiled, still homeless, and still penniless. Afghanistan is the world's largest producer of opium and now the world's largest producer of heroin. زراعت تبا سوی شفاخانه تبا سوی تجارت تبا سوی تعلیمی اداری تبا سوی مکتبونه تبا سوی سرکونه تبا دی و لگا دا فقر دا خلق بلا شارن لری چود There can never be peace and democracy in Afghanistan Why? Because peace and democracy would expose and cut off corporate America's opium and heroin trade at the source so what was the payoff for the U.S.-British war on Afghanistan? One, the uncooperative Taliban warlords got kicked out and replaced by the cooperative Northern Alliance warlords. Two, opium and heroin production and revenue skyrocketed. Three, Afghanistan got a new leader named Hamid Karzai, who just happens to be an ex-employee of Unical Oil. Three, America got permission to build their oil and gas pipeline through Afghanistan. In the 1980s, the United States supported Iraq's invasion of its neighbor, Iran, to stop the spread of Iran's Islamic Revolution. America played both sides of the Iran-Iraq War by supplying Saddam with chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction, and at the same time, America secretly sold weapons to Iran and illegally diverted the money to the Contra revolutionaries in Central America. During the war, the United States sent a special envoy to see Saddam in 1983. He was Donald Rumsfeld, now the U.S. Defense Secretary. The two men discussed how to reinforce Iraq against a common enemy. This was at a time when Iraq was using chemical weapons on Iranian troops. U.S. companies were supplying components with Washington's knowledge. By 1990, President George Bush Sr. tricked Iraq into another war with another oil-rich neighbor, Kuwait. How? by supplying Kuwait with horizontal drills that could reach beneath the border of Iraq and siphon oil from Iraq's oil fields. Kuwait used the U.S.-made drills to steal 300,000 barrels of oil per day from Iraq, worth over $3 billion annually. The fuse was lit, and Kuwait did nothing to put it out. They pumped oil without restraint from Ramayla oil field, which was accessible to both Kuwait and Iraq, and they exceeded OPEC quotas, flooding the market and driving prices even lower. George Bush Sr. officially promised not to interfere in Iraq's legitimate oil battle with Kuwait, but when Saddam's army entered Kuwait to defend their oil reserves, Bush pounced on them. Our goal is not the conquest of Iraq. It is the liberation of Kuwait. America disposed of its toxic waste problem by building radioactive depleted uranium right into their bombs and dropping them on Iraq. Bush Sr. not only devastated and poisoned Iraq's water systems and infrastructure, he weakened the economies of both Kuwait and Iraq, collected giant profits from rationed Iraqi food for oil programs, and landed massive rebuilding contracts in Kuwait. Bush Sr. followed up the Gulf War with 10 long years of deadly trade sanctions that killed another one and a half million Iraqi people, including 600,000 children, who were cut off from medical supplies. A bookstore in the United States today, you can find 50 books. 
celebrating different aspects of the war and how grand it all was. And you only find one that points out that this was a war crime, uh, that uh, demonstrates uh, the evidence that shows that we deliberately targeted civilians and killed more than a quarter of a million people in Iraq. You'll be fighting not to conquer anybody, but to liberate people. In March 2003, President George Bush Jr. launched the second Gulf War. The war on Iraq wasn't about revenge for 911, since not one of the 19 accused terrorists were Iraqi citizens. It wasn't about weapons of mass destruction, which inspectors hadn't found. It wasn't even about Saddam Hussein, who had been financed into power by the U.S. in the first place and who got his chemical and biological weapons from American companies. No, the U.S. wars against Iraq and against Afghanistan were about mass murder and piracy. They were about big weapons sales, big oil, big pipelines, big drugs, and big rebuilding contracts. They were about colonizing the Middle East and moving two giant steps closer to world domination. Private first class Lindy England may never have figured these images would beam into the homes of millions of horrified people. Whatever she might have thought at the time, she says she and her comrades had no choice. So to stand there, give a thumbs up, smile, stand behind all the naked Iraqis in the pyramid, take a picture. Who told you to do that? Persons in my higher chain of command. Why were naked Muslim prisoners positioned on top of each other in the shape of an Egyptian pyramid? The answer can be found in the distant past. In ancient times, Iraq was called Babylon. The year is 586 BC. The armies of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, descend on Jerusalem with the wrath of an angry god. It is almost six centuries before the birth of Christ. The Romans have not yet even dreamed of empire. It is a dark chapter in the history of the Jews, while Babylon's fierce star is rising. The Bible describes the Babylonian attack. Homes are pillaged, King Solomon's temple is set ablaze and utterly destroyed. Saddam Hussein made the mistake of comparing himself to Babylon's King Nebuchadnezzar. The capture of Iraq and Saddam Hussein was not just about oil and colonization, it was also about settling an old Hebrew score. We got him. On December 13th, the producers of 911 released a new reality TV show called We Got Em. The Iraqi people claimed the We Got Em video show was staged. Why? Because the video shows ripe, yellow-colored dates growing on a tree to the left of the hole, where Saddam Hussein was supposedly captured. Every Iraqi citizen knows that Iraqi dates only ripen and turn yellow in July and August, never in December. Since date trees don't tell lies, the We Got Em video had to be staged at least three months earlier in July or August, not on December 13th as reported. How could Saddam, who is almost 70 years old and over six feet tall, with a bloated belly, squeeze in and out of a hole that small? How could he have grown a beard that long in such a short time? Why did he dye his hair black while in hiding? For his CNN close-ups, perhaps? There are three books which clearly map out the Zionist plan for world domination. The Bible, written by Hebrews. Morals and Dogma, written by Freemason Albert Pike and the Protocols of Zion, written by the Priori of Zion and revised by the Zionist Illuminati. 
The Zionist plan is to create an apocalypse that will exhaust and depopulate the masses through deadly designer viruses, global terror, economic disasters, and nuclear war, and when the remaining survivors will gladly embrace the promises of a handsome, charismatic new leader who will unveil his plan of hope for eternal world peace. The only way to achieve eternal world peace, he will explain, is to put an end to the five causes of war. Secretly, he knows there is only one main cause of wars, the wars caused by his royal ancestors who planned, provoked, financed, and profited from them. He will sell his peace plan by telling the world that border wars will only end by creating a world without borders. Religious wars will only end by creating one world religion of interfaiths. Economic wars will only end by creating a cashless, debt-free society. Rivalry wars between rulers will only end by creating one world ruler. The tools used for war, from handguns to nuclear bombs, will be eliminated, and one world army will be created, which will guarantee world peace. How will this eternal peace plan be accomplished? Through the United Nations, which is the brainchild of the Committee of 300 Ruling Families. The UN is their vehicle for world government and is located on 18 acres of prime Manhattan land donated by the most visible of the ruling families, the Rockefellers. The UN is a closed organization with no public records or open meetings. U.S. taxpayers have already invested two trillion dollars in this world authority. Although most of the people working for the UN are genuinely working for peace, the UN is a godless organization controlled by the Committee of 300. These inbred ruling families pretend to have royal blue blood, but their blood is no more blue or royal than Hannibal Lecter's blood. Some speculate that these families of evildoers are demons or aliens or evil shape-shifting reptilians, but there is a more scientific explanation for their madness. For thousands of years, these families have practiced inbreeding between sisters and brothers, uncles and nieces, mothers and sons, to keep the power and wealth all in the family. This practice of inbreeding over thousands of years has produced a clever but pathological breed of conscienceless, sociopathic families who will stop at nothing to own every ounce of gold, every drop of water, and every blade of grass on planet Earth. The United Nations, which they founded and control, has clearly stated its goals of establishing a new world order, a UN standing army, and a global taxation system. The Queen's husband, Prince Philip, and Evelyn Rothschild have already established an interfaith declaration for the creation of one world religion. What would life be like in this world empire with one world religion, one world army, one world economy, one world court, one world media, one world government, and one world dictator. What the public doesn't know is that Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto and the Russian Constitution have been built into the UN Charter, and that the New World Order will be a communist world order. Peace on Earth will be a forced peace in which citizens will have no rights. No right to bear children without approval, no right to travel without authorization, no right to own private property, no right to privacy, no right to bear arms, no right to protest, no right to receive an inheritance, no right to choose an education or a job or even a place of residence, and worst of all, no right to live. The right to live will be based on an individual's rating of usefulness to the royal elite. In this planned world without borders or nations, Citizens will be disarmed of all weapons, including handguns, and will have no means to protest, fight, resist, or challenge this one world authority who will control them spiritually, economically, and militarily. Every human being will be electronically tattooed and will become helplessly dependent on this one world authority for all of their most basic needs. The masses will eventually be taught to bow down and worship this one world dictator who will rule the entire world from his eternal throne in Israel. They have waited for him. They believe in him. 
They expect he will heal the world's ills. Some say he is the Messiah, finally returned. But this man is not a savior. He is the king of terror who will usher in the end of everything. Despite all the red flags, many people deny that a problem even exists. It does exist, and the good news is there are solutions. The solutions lie in knowing what the three biggest fears of the world's ruling families are. The first biggest fear is exposure. They have gone to great lengths to cover up their trail of crimes and to win the public's trust through their media monopolies. Without public trust, their ancestral plan for global control is doomed. Their second biggest fear is losing public support. If the public stops cooperating, their plan is guaranteed to fail. Their third biggest nightmare is organized resistance by an informed and fearless public. The ruling families know from past experience that the will of the people can defeat all their military and monetary might. Vietnam is a perfect example. There is no doubt whatsoever that these ruling families can be totally defeated by turning their three worst fears into a reality.